So uh, time has come. Uh, welcome to the uh, today's public lecture. Uh, my name is Oiwa Jeka Senior Fellow attached to the Rika in School. And uh, today it, the seminar title is East Asian Regionalism, Power, Interest, and Institution Building by the Professor Takashi Terada. Uh, as you may know, the, uh, in the next month, uh, middle of next month, we have the APEC Summit in Tokyo. Uh, following the uh, G20 meeting, and that uh, t t this, uh, this year's APEC is the target year of the BOGO or GO, and to, for the advanced country economy to free their uh, trade for the uh, APEC member countries. So uh, this year, we need to renegotiate the, uh, this the issue. Maybe uh, this is a really uh, strategic issue, but uh, for this region, this APEC is not only one regional framework. There are so many maps of the integration here in East Asia, uh, such as the uh, ASEAN, AF, ARF, or uh, ASEAN Plus and so on. So, uh, to deal with, to this, understand this situation, today's lecture uh, aims to analyze the chronological order of the regional institution building as a key clue to this puzzle. The order of institution building is important from the perspective of power and interest. And uh, Professor Terada's hypothesis for this is the influential major power tend to judge that the functions and the norms of an existing regional institution do not accord with their own interests and work to build an institution based on a new regional concept and purposes, which they hope to promote uh, they promote. So uh, with this hypothesis, he will explain the action and interest of the major powers, such as the United States, China, and Japan, uh, conducive to the establishment of the, these kind of regional institutions. I just introduce Professor Terada. Uh, professor Terada is the professor of the International Relations at Organization for Asian Studies, Waso University in Tokyo. Uh, he received the PhD, PhD from Osan National University, and before uh, serving for Waseda University, he is the assistant professor of this uh, National University of Singapore, more than six years. And uh, uh, he is uh, specialized, uh, his interest in the uh, political, political economy, especially for the regionalism and not regional integration for Asia Pacific. And uh, not only uh, political economy, he's now enlarged his interest of the norms and the uh, principles of the region integrity itself, such as human security or human rights issues. And he's a very busy man. Oh, uh, almost every, how to say, uh, second track meeting of the symposium or uh, the uh, negotiation, he would attend uh, requested by the ministries of Japan. So, uh, I'd like to invite Professor Terada. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Oiwa, for a kind introduction about myself. And very uh, good afternoon. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone here for coming uh, to the seminar all the way at your very busy time. Um, as Mr. Oya just mentioned, um, I came from uh, Waseda University in Tokyo. Well, probably most of you don't know the university, and, but uh, Waseda has produced the, uh, quite a number of uh, well, prominent politician, politicians, business leaders, and I have to say Mr. Oya as well. <laughs> and uh, well, Waseda particularly is proudly establishing long-term is relationships with Asian countries, especially China, South Korea, since 19th century. Waseda's very first exchange program can be traced back to the 1880-something. Uh, and we accepted since then uh, exchange children from China, who later became a political leaders in China. And just to represent that, Mr. Fuchintao, came to Tokyo two years ago as the very first Chinese leader since 1998, Jiang Zemin. 
And interestingly, really John Zemin and Fujinto came to Waseda University to give a speech that indicated you know, how China well, appreciated the our universities and also the relationship with us. Well, uh, I'm not interested in talking about China-Japan relationship today. <laughs> but of course, you know, if you're interested, I'd be happy to provide my own uh, personal thought. But uh, I have to emphasize that, you know, the, uh, at least my university uh, has been establishing quite good and warm relationship with China. For example, in my seminar and honors class, uh, I have four Chinese students, and uh, they're always you know, enjoying talking and studying with Japanese counterparts. So it seems to me, you know, was suddenly something happening in the ocean, but when I came back to the uh, university campus, you know, normal life has not been changed. So this is something, I think, reality uh, which is going on in Japan. Anyway, so my talk is a bit different. Of course, China-Japan relationships are quite a significant factor for considering the uh, well, evolution or development of East Asian regionalism, maybe including APEC. Uh, however, I, I just try to explain, probably describe the big, big picture particularly looking at the over the last two decades and how the you know, trend of regionalism can be explained. And uh, particularly, I'm happy to be making a presentation in Singapore because the, uh, I, I'm not necessarily a ASEAN supporter. Well, sorry to say this. <laughs> uh, although I had uh, spent uh, well, seven years in Singapore, actually working, as Oliver Sam mentioned, as an assistant and associate professor at the NUS, but not this campus. Actually, first time for me to visit here. But I, I used to work in uh, another campus, Kent Ridge. So I'm, I'm quite happy to be able to, you know, the new campus here. Well, as uh, Mr. Oliver mentioned in the beginning, there are quite few uh, regional institutions which at least aims to promote regional integration or regional cooperation within their own framework. Well, starting with the uh, well, bottom line, as I mentioned, ASEAN with 10 countries uh, to upwards, ASEAN plus three, 13 nations, and the US, East Asian Summit, 16 countries, and APEC, 21. So I have to say, economies, no countries. Well, you know the reason. But also, I try to touch on this presentation, the probably minimum number of the states framework, which is actually we call CJK. Do you understand what CJK means? <laughs> it stands for China, Japan, and Korea. This means trilateral cooperation uh, especially uh, since 2008, December, which saw the first time the trilateral summit in Fukuoka, Japan. And since then, the annual summit meeting has been held together with more than 10 ministerial meetings among three nations. And uh, South Korea is quite happy to set up the secretariat for the trilateral cooperation. So this is quite similar organizational approach to ASEAN. Different functional meetings with head of the government meetings with the secretariat. So at least we have a, well, trilateral cooperation, ASEAN, ASEAN plus three, East Asian Summit, and APEC. And my question needs, as uh, Mr. Oya just mentioned, why well, have several regional institutions have come to exist, well, sorry, emerge and coexist? Why not replacing each other? And to understand this, I just set up the quite simple approach just to try to examine how the institution, each institution 
have been set up? What factors influencing the emergence of these institutions? So I just set up the simple order of the institution buildings, starting from the old epic in 1989, Canberra. Well, actually, I came this time from Canberra. So I had a quite a good discussion, not, not this topic, but more on well, FTAs and uh, APEC. And also, well, again, well, Australian ministry is more interested in China Japan stuff. So, busy, busy discussions. But uh, mainly, uh, I had uh, spent time with uh, OG ministries and also academics at uh, my own uh, alumni, alumni uh, Australian National University. But anyway, it started in Canberra in 1989. But Asian Plus 3 was established in 1997 in Kuala Lumpur at the sideline meeting to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the ASEAN establishment. So it was Asian Plus 3's beginning was not necessarily considered to inject a new regional cooperation project. It was simply a symbolic event. But, as you can guess, 1997 was the Asian financial crisis year. And Malaysia, together with Indonesia and Thailand, as well as South Korea, was also involved. Although they were, you know, the uh, approach to tackling the crisis was, of course, different. So, as plus three, it seems to me the development was quite, you know, discreetly made until the year 2000, when the, uh, we saw the so-called Chenma initiatives, the bilateral soap and agreement, arrangement established. And then 2005, a simple six framework was well, coined and created. Well, that's embed, uh, realized at the EAS, East Asian Summit. Again, it was held in Kuala Lumpur. Coincidentally, the chair of ASEAN was Malaysia, as we saw in 1997's case. But this time, Malaysia worked very hard to get to the first, uh, the first venue for the East Asian Summit, the very only institution which had the name East Asia. And finally, I call new APEC. APEC exists since 1989. However, norms and approaches, it seems to me, have been changing. So I just put the year 2006 and 2008. So what happened in both, uh, both years? 2006, it was the first time the so-called free trade area in Asia Pacific, what we have FTAP, was mentioned by the United States. And the first time FTAP was included in the chairman's statement, sorry, chairman's statement of the APEC summit, or APEC leaders meeting. It was held in Hanoi. And 2008, this was the last year for President Bush's participation in the APEC leaders meeting. And he and the US government announced its participation in TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Again, well, if you were in Singapore, you know the, how the TPP was mentioned, or well, created. It's a very small FTA, started by Singapore, Brunei, New Zealand, and uh, Chile. Very diversified, not economically interlinked so much. And it started in 2006. I was already in Singapore at that time, so when I read the news in the Straits Times, you know, I was a bit puzzled why Singapore was interested in this kind of multilateral, but you know, the, with only small economies. What Singapore wanted to do? But eventually, we came to know Singapore's ambitions to involve, eventually, a big nations in uh, no bilateral 
multilateral regional integration framework fits obviously means APEC. And the U.S. announced it in 2008. And interestingly, when EBS already had interest, showed interest in two, uh, September 2008. And since then, Australia particularly studied very carefully and asking you know, industrial organizations, academics, you know, to send their own questions and comment. And just within two years, they compiled and came to the conclusion that we should join it. So soon after the U.S. announcement in joining TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, Australia and Peru joined it. And as you may know, later on, Vietnam, and more recently, Malaysia, because Malaysia gave up the bilateral FTA with the United States, mainly because of the U.S. interest in touching on the removal or deregulating the uh, Bumiputra policy. So instead, Malaysia decided to join the TPP. So currently, nine nations have been engaged in the negotiations. Started this year in Melbourne, Brunei, sorry, Brunei just last week, but before that, uh, San Francisco, maybe Los Angeles, maybe I thought which one. Anyway, in California. So three negotiations have been so far carried out and involving more and more nations. So therefore, compared with the old APEC, which tried to promote open regionalism, which is based on the uh, most favored nation treatment, again, open and regionalism is contradictory. If you want to have a open, you don't need to create regionalism. Regionalism, by nature, tends to discriminate against outsiders. But APEC's approach was just to, for example, provide the benefits to be accrued from the liberalizations to outsiders like European Union, who are not asking the EU to open its market. So politically, it's quite um, you know, difficult. The US didn't like it. So this is one of the reasons why the APEC's open regionalism was not so far implemented. But new APEC, like FTAAP or TPP, different in terms of norms, because it's a discriminatory. So therefore, I just try to distinguish the you know, early and recent APEC in terms of its own approach to the integrations. So question, why we have a different institutions aiming to promote regional integration within its frameworks. So hypothesis, again, uh, it's not, of course, complicated as well. I try to focus on more powerful states. And they try to work on to create a new one, which approaches, norms, interests, functions are set up and quite in line with its own interests. So therefore, as I wrote here, a powerful state judges that functions and norms of the existing regional institutions do not accord with its own interests and then commit itself to another one, which would serve its own interests better. So it's sort of revolutions. Sorry. So let me explain in each case. So in this case, we have three. From all the APEC to ASEM plus three, ASEM plus three to APEC, and sorry, ASEM plus three to ASEM plus six, and plus six to APEC. Point is, in each case, from old to new, they are relevant. So let me explain that. Maybe I should stand up because I'm always standing up and you know, giving lectures. So I'm feeling quite a bit uncomfortable in sitting. <laughs> and also I have some pains here. Maybe I should go to another massage, which I enjoyed last night. <laughs> but it's a bit hard to see. <laughs> okay, all the way back to uh, ASEAN plus three. Okay, powerful nation. Yes, China and Japan. At that time, their interests could be seen as quite similar. Although they are not necessarily working together. I have never seen China and Japan working together. 
in the regional institution buildings. But the point is, you know, they, without knowing that, came to share. First, the epic, as I mentioned, well, it's hard to say fail, particularly there are some epic people here. <laughs> But failing to promote trade investment liberalization, at least, you know, I, I'm just mentioning the you know, approach called early voluntary sector liberalization, or EVSL, in 1997, 1998, and, uh, which means APEC gave up employing collective approach to a limited number of sectors liberalizations. So in this case, only 10 sectors, actually, APEC decided to have a joint approach to trade liberalization. Otherwise, it should be left to individual countries. You can do, you can liberalize any time, any sectors, but they, any, every year you have to report. And in front of other federal countries, economies, and say, hey, you are not committed to liberalization. Why not? So this is so-called peer pressure approach, rather than based on the legal framework. So in this case, no burning force, no enforcement of rules, of course, punishment as well. No. Therefore, Japan was able to remove some liberalization areas like fisheries and forests. Japan said no. And a couple of the nations like Canada, United States, and Australia, in some cases, Indonesian tyrants were quite unhappy. But again, as I mentioned, it was year 1997, Asian finance crisis hit. Interestingly, Japan came forward to promise to provide the hard currencies, if you are hoping it. But it's sort of the you know, pressure they are feeling to abide by what Japan wanted to do. Eventually, most of the Asian nations, Asian economies, did not you know, they commit to excluding fisheries and forestries from the EVSL programs. So this was what I mentioned here, failing, failure to promote APEC white trade liberalization. Of course, it's left to the individual nations. So you can easily say, no, no, APEC was important because APEC served to reduce tariffs. But, as I mentioned, there was no binding force. There is no collective approach. How come you can judge it? It seems to me it's quite difficult to discern what sectors were promoted, sorry, uh, liberalized by certain economies just because of APEC. And COP with uh, Asian finance crisis, again, many people at that time criticized APEC because APEC didn't work for helping APEC. But uh, to make it a bit fair to APEC, APEC didn't have a, such kind of function to provide you know, the short liquidity to the problematic nations. It was IMF's work. Well, I suppose maybe ADB should be more involved. Actually, ADB didn't. So it was simply IMF with you know, the conditions, as you may know. So therefore, but quite a few people say APEC ASEAN didn't function well for helping the countries hit by Asian financial crisis. And finally, after the 9-11 in 2001, America regained its interest in using APEC, particularly finding the merit in meeting the big leaders like from Indonesia, Malaysia, Muslim countries. So America, first time, was able to bring human, sorry, national security agendas into the chairman statement in 2001. So Shanghai, at that time Shanghai, was chairing the APEC meeting. Shanghai statement include anti-terrorist measures. Sounds a bit unusual for regional economic cooperation, but it was the U.S. interest. And since then, anti-terrorism measures and other stuff related to human security have been incorporated in the APEX chairman statements. 
and America continue to find it important. I believe this is the reason why Mr. Bush, George W. Bush, attended all APEC meetings during his term from 2001 to 2008. Just look at the previous government, Mr. Clinton, who didn't come to twice APEC leaders' meeting. First one was actually important for us. 1995, APEC was held in Japan. One of the allied nations, key allied nations of the United States, but the U.S. president didn't come to the leaders' meeting. Second time was the uh, 1997, Kuala Lumpur. Well, it's maybe understandable. <laughs> and Al Gore, vice president, came. He didn't touch anything on APEC, touched on more human rights issues, particularly mentioning former deputy president, uh, prime minister, Anwar Ibrahim. And Malaysia was very angry. But, you know, the 1995 ASPEC Osaka meeting was very significant. We set up then how the liberalization mechanism could be promoted. However, U.S. was not. Compared with this, George W. Bush came. Although they have not so, so much significant economic agendas, unfortunately. So, this was America's interest, changing the norms of APEC, shifting it towards more on security agendas. But this approach was not necessarily warmly welcomed by quite a few Asian nations. Uh, I, f I knew the, uh, some of the ASEAN government officials said, okay, APEC rewards economic cooperation, not security cooperation. But if the U.S. tried to move it, we tried to be more engaged in our own institution, which was ASEAN Plus 3 joined by only East Asian nations, ASEAN 10 members plus China, Japan, South Korea. And ASEAN plus three approach to regional cooperation, regional integration, which means FTA, already started in the year 2000. The ASEAN plus three meeting was held actually in here, Singapore. And as you may know, this was the year and the venue when China offered FTA to ASEAN. So this was the beginning of ASEAN plus one FTA. Now we had five ASEAN plus one FTAs, China, Korea, Japan, India, and also New Zealand. And as I wrote here, particularly getting back to the Asian French crisis, China and Japan worked very hard, not jointly, but individually. And Japan's commitment was already mentioned. But of course, China's, well, China was not so much influenced by Asian financial crisis. Well, it's obvious. Very strong capital control. <laughs> and, uh, but China decided not to devaluate Chinese yuan. It's a bit different from current situations. Of course, you know, they're not to promote exports. So ASEAN was appreciating that, at least China's, you know, the behavior. It was only China which could do it. Strong capital control, government commitment. If we did it, you know, the money control could be easily done. So it was not constant. ASEAN plus three's very first and foremost agenda was financial rather than trade cooperation. So Chairman Initiatives, signed in 2000. Network of Barato Swap Agreement, it's an exchange of the, you know, the reserves. But as you know, the APEC didn't have this kind of function. So East Asian countries, which had a terrible experience in 1997-8, decided to promote ASEAN Plus 3 with their own agendas, detached from APEX and Japan-China's commitment. But U.S. attitude, unlike the uh, AMA, sorry, Asian, Asian Monetary Fund, which actually Japan proposed, but the 
United States didn't like it and destroyed it. We don't need a second IMF in this region. IMF was enough. Even Malaysia's early proposal of East Asian Economic Caucus, EAC, was also demolished by the United States. Don't split Asia Pacific. But unlike these two cases, America's attitude to the CMR, sorry, uh, Sempra 3, what they call the uh, benign neglect. Asian, so American leaders, senior officials say, it's quite sound development. And we are accepting and we are welcoming ASEAN Plus 3 framework. But that could be probably considered to be useful for stabilizing the regional economies. Maybe regional political situations. That was certainly the U.S. interests. But the U.S. Needed to, needed to change the attitude later on. Now let me say something about ASEAN Plus 3 to East Asia. The powerful nations are Japan and the United States, particularly Japan. ASEAN Plus 3, yes, was developing. Initially, the U.S. said, fine, but eventually concerned because China's rise was also accompanied and the influencing the agenda settings within ASEAN Plus 3. And the U.S. believed Japan, only Japan, couldn't do it, couldn't stop it. For example, ASEAN plus three's most members are developing countries. And China always say we are representative of developing countries. And it creates quite easy for them to have a quite similar interest for example, intellectual property rights. There's a very significant agenda in the APEC framework. And the United States, Japan tend to work together to put the pressure on developing countries, especially China, to promote intellectual property rights norms. But the same plus three, there was no such kind of agenda. Of course, human rights, democracy, it's rule of laws, etc. It's not the agenda of ASEAN plus three. And the U.S. came to be quite concerned about it. And simply China's predominance. Japan's influence was very limited. So what the U.S. talked with Japan was to bring some countries which the U.S. believed sharing the same values and norms. Or creating a new institutions with the new memberships. Which was actually Australia New Zealand inclusion. It was mentioned by Japanese Prime Minister at that time, Junichiro Koizumi, who came to, yes, this country, Singapore, uh, Shangri-La Hotel, 14th of January 2002. I remember the date because I was invited. Well, I asked the embassy to give me a seat. And they gave me a very good seat. Just back seat of then Prime Minister Go Jokton. But it was no good seat eventually because I couldn't see Prime Minister because he was too tall. So I always, you know, the <laughs> shaking my necks. Anyway, that speech was the beginning of the movement supporting the uh, framework which we call East Asian Community. Well, as you may know, the uh, former Japanese Prime Minister, Hatoyama, who was supposed to promote the East Asian community idea, but if you read the text read by Prime Minister Koizumi in Singapore Shangri-La Hotel, he mentioned community. But he didn't say East Asian community, probably it's too much. But a community building in the region, in East Asia, and he mentioned Australia and New Zealand should be joining as a core members of East Asia. Of course, many people cast a doubt because Australia particularly was not considered to be an East Asian country. Before coming to Singapore, Koizumi visited the four other capitals of Southeast Asian countries. And for example, Dr. Mahathir of Malaysia. 
Oh, Mr. Koizumi, we welcome your idea. We all support your idea. But I had one disagreement. Don't include Australia. But Japan's interest in bringing Australia was actually in line with America's concerns. And since then, Australia was also requested by both nations to improve some relationship with key Southeast Asian countries like Malaysia, yes, and Indonesia, whose relationship was so strained because of this team of problems in 1999. So, East Asian Summit eventually was established in 2005 in Kuala Lumpur, but there was a contested debut. A CM Plus 3 should be transformed into East Asian Summit. This was the original idea. So, in this case, a CM Plus 3 should have been replaced by East Asian Summit, but because of what is this? Three minutes. <laughs> I saw 30 minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. What am I talking? Oh, Maris, yeah. Okay. Well, 2005, but again, original text was changed, not transformed. Since then, ASEAN Plus 3 East Asian Summit coexisted and taking a quite similar path. For example, next week we have a Sam Plus EAS meeting, maybe this weekend, in Hanoi. And I read the boss, draft of the boss statements of chairmen. And I see, so the EAS actually mentioned some financial cooperation. I have never seen the EAS tackling on the financial problems. And again, a Sam Plus I don't know, it's a draft, so it may be eventually changed. But a Sam Plus chairman statement also includes again Plus three, plus six, which one East Asia will take as a framework for regional integration? So it seems to me battle was still continuing on. And uh, that's probably not necessarily good news to East Asia as a whole. But anyway, as you know, the U.S. officially joined the EAS next year. But I don't think the United States is joining ASEAN plus 3 FTA. That's a different story. But the point is, EAS was created by Japan and the United States who are not concerned, who are concerned about China's dominance within ASEAN plus 3 framework. Okay, let me just uh, spin it up. Plus 6 to APEC, it was United States, excluding from both institutions in East Asia. Reason, two reasons, created by Japan and China, Japan actually proposed so-called ASEAN Plus 6 FTA. And the U.S. called it a bit shocker because Japan was considered to be a loyal ally to the United States. But Japan, which proposed Plus 6 FTA, excluding the United States. And interestingly, this was proposed by the Minister of Economy and Trade and Industry, METI, and if it didn't consult with Minister of Foreign Affairs, I had. I don't know if question, if there had been some consultation involving Minister of Foreign Affairs, what well, situation might have been changed. But well, someone in a meeting told me that the you know, US was too much preoccupied with non Asian issues at that time, like Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, not paying enough attention to Asia. So it was sort of the approach for inviting the American's interest in Asia matters by providing such a shocker you know, approach. But anyway, I don't know whether it's true or not, but at least it was mentioned by a senior official of the Japanese government. Finally, China was through the ASEAN Plus One FTAs enjoyed the credit through its efforts to promote raw qualities, again, developing nations, don't need to abide the Article 20, uh, Article of the GATT, which you know, stipulates the conditions. So therefore, American believers, it's a lot of you know, the exceptions. But you know, China was acclaimed as a mover 
of trade liberalization in East Asia, again, excluding the United States. So what the U.S. tried to do, particularly feeling pressure from the business societies in the U.S., was to change the norms of the institution in which U.S. joined officially, which is APIC, to bring more discriminatory, rule-based FTA approaches. Again, which was effed up and laid down TPP. Well, I tried, to, well, I wanted to explain more U.S. and TPP, but again, time is limited. But the point is, U.S. wanted to engage more countries because APEX, sorry, America's interest in Singapore, Brunei, Chile, and New Zealand it's not based on the trade liberalization effort. Of course, from U.S. viewpoint, individually, it's quite small. And already U.S. had FTA with Singapore. Why U.S. needed it? This is quite similar to what Singapore wanted to do, which I mentioned in the beginning of today's seminar, expanding eventually to create the original framework, which could be enough to enjoy the rule of sorry, scale of economy eventually. And Japan, sorry, I'm from Japan, so I have to touch on at least my country. Yes, new government endorsed FTAP, free trade aid in the Asia Pacific, as a target of regional integration by 2020. However, never mentioned TPP in an official statement. But if you read the Japanese media, newspapers particularly, TPP has been, has been a quite uh, frequently used terminology, because the Prime Minister mentioned in a public speech, we are interested in joining TPP. But Japanese agricultural sectors, of course, were strongly against it, because TPP means FTA with United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Actually, I had New Zealand finally offer the FTA to Japan two weeks ago. I don't know why it was mentioned by New Zealand agriculture minister to the Japanese agriculture minister. Of course, the agriculture minister said no. Because New Zealand export, more than 70% of New Zealand export to Japan are agriculturally oriented. So we couldn't accept it. So this is the current debate in Japan how the TPP could be dealt with in a Japanese political situation. And moreover, when Japan hosts APEC in Yokohama in a few weeks' time, when the Japanese Prime Minister is able to announce its official participation in TPP, this is quite significant for the APEC future because the U.S. is hosting APEC next year. It is quite certain that U.S. one of the major agendas for the Honolulu meeting next year includes liberalization, probably TPP. Okay, maybe I should stop. I just tried to touch on my PP, uh, not PPT, PowerPoint. Yes, PPT. No, PPT. It's confusing. Anyway. Uh, financial Corporation, ASEAN Plus 3, has been more developed by involving so called chain initiative multilateralization. And I want to say, this is my own interest in the current paper. Singapore will be the venue was city which established surveillance office independently setting up from IMF. That's a very interesting case. And also I touched on the further development plus six, particularly U.S. engagement under Bush, uh, Obama administration, including ASEAN-U.S. summit, just held last year in Singapore, and just held in New York last month. You know, U.S. commitment I just described has been quite remarkable. And this was the one of the factors behind uh, Sri Pitsuan's terminology, ASEAN centralities. Suddenly, U.S. backing was a strong factor behind his decision to change from sitting in a driver's seat to the ASEAN centralities. Again, trilateral cooperation, which I also, my own current interest, 
point is, it's not something new. We have already 10 years' experiences of this China-Japan-Korea cooperation. And a number of functional cooperations, including tourist ministers in, in a meeting, which held in China two months ago. It was very interesting. Yes, it was before Senkak problem. And the Chinese government first time decided to invite major Japanese tourist companies in China to cope with Chinese visitors to Japan. And Japan deregulated conditions for issuing visa to Chinese. So more Chinese tourists coming into Japan at the moment. Of course, major reason was to ask them to spend more money. But most significantly, China, Japan, Korea decided to set up some ways to improve trilateral tourism, trilateral tourist in uh, initiatives. That was quite, I think, interesting. And again, getting back to my original question, CJK approach was also in line with my own hypothesis. There are two probably different, in this case, anomalies to my hypothesis. First, this was no major country's initiative. It's a quite gradual step. China took initiative, no. Japan, no. Maybe South Korea, more committed. And also, they're happy or unhappy with uh, existing institutions? Perhaps yes. I said perhaps not. But I came to believe maybe yes. Three reasons. Maybe you can read. Political instability in the Southeast Asia. That sometimes hampered East Asian cooperation. Number two, Japan, Korea, you know, they uh, tend to co each other, cooperate each other, particularly targeting China to get to you know, more their own norm-oriented problems, like investment treaties, intellectual property rights, etc. And finally, look at the figures. Predominance of uh, three countries' economies, particularly you know, their contribution to CMIM, which accounts for 87%, compared with ASEAN 10 countries, 13%. It's a huge uh, parity, disparity. Uh, uh, finally, I just wanted to talk about institutional Darwinism, which actually teacher Pemper, a friend of mine from Berkeley, wrote in a paper recently. And you know, it's a process of Darwinism, you know, depressing or disappearing, new and created, etc. But uh, I, I'm not necessarily comfortable with this approach, as far as I read his paper. But three probably independent variables which we need to take, a t take account. Otherwise, um, it's quite hard to declare it's a process of Darwinism. Again, power initiator, which I just highlighted, China, Japan, United States, strive to maintain its interest, obviously. They're not probably giving up, which they created easily. Number two. China-Japan confrontations affect the uh, leader flow of matric, particularly Korea and ASEAN. Well, ASEAN, you know, the, uh, uh, how do you say, feeling attracted by China, what some people say, well, China offensive, but some say, no, China should be removed now. You know, this approach suddenly created a view that, you know, the ASEAN-China relationship was much probably better than Japan-ASEAN's. I disagree, however. But if it were taken so, how do you know, China's current you know, the many, uh, ambitions affect you know, this you know, matrix? Matrix means you know, the friendship, degree of friendships among key players involving ASEAN, Korea, etc. And finally, of course, US. It seems to me U.S. engagement in East Asia have been quite you know, the, uh, promoted using multilateral tracks. First, ASEAN. Second, through Korea and Japan this time. And um, again, this is a future question. I'm not the uh, fortune teller, so I, I, I cannot predict. 
But you know, this approach, U.S. You know, the multi-track approach to the regional engagement, it's certainly significant for considering questions including China's behavior in the future. But again, my question is how this was relevant to the regional integration uh, competitions. So this is probably a question to you. And I'm very happy to get your own answers for my you know, the possible uh, writing papers on this topic. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much for delivering us the very, how to say, very original. Usually, the uh, chairman take uh, a privilege to have the first question, but the time is re so limited. So I'd like to uh, immediately open the floor for the question and answer. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, it's hard to, agree, to disagree with the idea that powerful states drive agendas. But I'm wondering if there's really two questions behind this evolving architecture. One is the extent to which Asia can create an intra-Asian grouping versus a grouping that includes the other side of the Pacific. And the other issue is about whether Japan and China can productively engage each other in a narrow or a broad framework. Let me just elaborate a little bit on the first and second points. Um, if you look at your chronology, beginning with the old APEC, what essentially happened was the old APEC was created in response to concerns about Mahatia's view of an Asian regional grouping. It's a response which keeps the other side of the Pacific in. You look at ASEAN plus three, you have initially what you call benign neglect, but then you see ASEAN plus six, we now have EAS plus two, we have TPP. Basically what's happening is we're converging to a form of regionalism that includes both Asian economies and the US. And when one looks at that kind of driver, I mean, the, the powerful state is clearly identifiable. The motive is linked, in essence, to the role of that state in the region and the nexus between economics and security. So I put it to you that perhaps that's one of the key drivers. And then you have the plus three where Japan and Korea engage because there was unhappiness on the part of some entities about the dominance of China within ASEAN plus three. And a response to that dominance drives East Asia Summit. So that's one question. And there's very finally on Chiang Mai, you could talk about the surveillance unit being independent, but 80% of Chiang Mai financing is still linked to the IMF, where the US is the dominant shareholder. So I would argue that the setup is far less a movement away from involving the other side of the Pacific than it actually appears on paper. Uh, thank you very much and for your interesting questions. Uh, well, China, Japan stuff, maybe, I think many people probably ask later on. So, uh, well, more Pacific nations involvement in Asian frameworks, probably this is a sort of trend and maybe you can predict. Uh, but if you look at, as I mentioned, you know, the uh, two major functional corporations, one, integration, second, well, as I mentioned, chamber initiatives. The point is whether it's, for example, United States interested in joining it. First, we just saw the uh, last year, Assembly 3 and ES leaders endorsed reports of the uh, F East Asian FTA, which is ASEAN plus three FTA, and uh, CPI, a Comprehensive Economic Partnership, we call six FTAs. And now the uh, government, senior government officials involved in that to provide a more reality check. So this is the current situation of the plus six, plus six, sorry, plus three, plus six FTAs. Point is, US is not involved. Integrations in East Asia have been well, gradually, though, going on without the United States. 
Chairman Stevens, yeah, you said uh, well, 80% IMF conditionalities. Uh, but point is, the uh, two things we have to consider. First, U.S. suddenly 1997 exercised you know, its own strong power to destroy the Japan's IMF, sorry, AMF proposals. The point is, the United States now is also interested in this. It seems to me the U.S. was too much preoccupied with domestic economies, particularly helping, you know, the, uh, or boosting its employment. Therefore, as far as I know, the U.S. has not touched on the development, multilateralization of Chenma initiatives. Reason was probably still Japan, sorry, ASEAN plus three nations keeps this IMF conditionalities. That means, of course, the U.S. is not a member of it, but through the IMF, U.S. so-called Washington Consensus approaches could be introduced. Yes, so in this case, I agree. But also, sec I have to consider that ASEAN plus the finance minister's meeting statement held in Bali 2009, May, it's clearly, maybe before that, in February, it's the ad hoc meeting, informal meeting, maybe that one. They already mentioned interest in reducing so-called IMF, the IMF link. That means ASEAN plus three had already shown an interest in reducing its reliance on IMF. So I don't know if each percent would be appropriate in this case, but a trend could be in line with what they said in official statement, it's less reliance on IMF. So again, getting back to your questions, yes, U.S. involvement, East Asian, Asian only framework, um, it seems to me probably going on without the United States in this case. But of course, uh, it's uh, future questions. But uh, secondly, you want to say something? I was just going to say, East Asia Summit plus two gets the U.S. in again. Yeah, but uh, there was no functional cooperation there. As I mentioned, there was no ag agreement on the U.S. joining in CPIA. Plus means ASEAN plus eight for the FTA. They call it ASEAN plus six plus two. I know, I know. But my point is the integration, you know, rule set. There's nothing going on on that. And the China-Japan stuff, briefly, uh, well, at least both nations showed an interest in mending relationships. Uh, already Japan offered the uh, China to create foreign ministers' meeting and prime ministers' meeting this weekend in Hanoi. And the question is whether China accepts it or not. Uh, probably, yes. Even not, Mr. Fu can, is coming to Yokohama next month. And if he says he has never mentioned about China-Japan's problem at the moment. So in this case, China still maintained his own card, keeping the head of government, while Mr. Khan has been heavily involved. So if he said, even without meeting the Mr. Khan, say, no, Japan-China relationship should be improved, I think that could be a proper beginning of doing something. And I heard that today that uh, China finally started you know, controlling anti-Chinese, sorry, anti-Japanese anti -Chinese demonstrations in all cities. And because China afraid, you know, that this could be transformed into anti-government demonstrations. So again, the uh, situation was changing, it seems to me, more favorably. And the point is whether you know, they tried to show the interest in using regional framework or promote something. I think if so, the potential venue doing that would be trilateral ones, China, Japan, uh, Korea ones, because already we are finishing the investment treaty, trilateral investment treaty negotiations, and the feasibility study for China, Japan, Korea, FTA should be submitting the report next year to uh, somewhere in Japan. So if there were some functional corporations going on, well, that might be a possibility that, you know, the, uh, of course, you know, just serving some territorial issues as we did so far over the last three decades, you know, we more engaged in regional corporations. 
Again, I don't know, but this is a simply future question. Well, the, uh, well, I think you're talking about F FTAA, yeah. free trade in the Americas. Uh, it seems to me the negotiations all, you know, they're frozen because of the uh, Brazils, and uh, now the Brazil are joined by the Argentina, particularly to stop the Americas, you know, the influence, you know, spreading in Latin America. So it seems to me uh, FTAA is on track. So this is quite different. And number two, well, if America is interested in extending the NAFTA to Latin America, well, NAFTA is a quite different FTA as compared with one we are observing in East Asia. Uh, for example, the uh, environment issues, labor clauses, uh, they have never been involved in uh, East Asian FTAs, particularly ASEANs. I remember when the U.S. Uh, initially approached Singapore for FTA in 2001, but there was a rumor that the U.S. Singapore FTA could be a so-called Jordan, Jordan type of FTA involving environment and labor clauses. And well, probably Singapore would be no problem for having it. But of course, as ASEAN members, Saronin couldn't have it. If you know the products are created, if America believed utilizing la cheap labors or uh, destroying the environment, you know, the standards, that could be probably not a target of the liberalization. Again, this kind of FTA, you know, the, uh, initiated by the United States, are not necessarily coming into this region. So, again, I'm not so sure about the future FTA um, format, but it seems to me the, uh, this kind of the sensitive uh, trading agendas are not in uh, East Asians. So I think it's quite different, it seems to me. Thank you very much for your kind uh, explanations. I, uh, you ask us to give answers, <laughs> so I'll try to attempt one. Uh, China, what they say and what they do may not be necessarily the same thing. Uh, this is what I noticed living in Asia for the past 22 years. And actually what they say and their real intention may be not necessarily the same thing. So something maybe to think about. Uh, the other question is uh, for you, is the recent uh, uh, difficult relationship between China and Japan, uh, whether the strengthening of the yen and China buying of the JGBs may be part of their strategies in putting pressure on Japan? Well, uh, thank you very much. And also thank you for your answer to my questions. I mean, the, uh, it's a sort of the rhetoric and the interests are quite you know, the different, particularly looking at the Chinese statement. Well, maybe so. On the uh, China, it's uh, interesting using you know, the burning Japanese bonds and uh, to exercise some influence. But there was, yes, rumor in Japan, because you know, as you know, the August you know, Japan, so the China actually sold quite a large number of the uh, Japanese and the bonds. And the, I think some people say, you know, this is a way of the putting pressure on Japan because Japan didn't like seeing the, you know, the yen being more evaluated. That would be very hard for exporting <laughs> to the region. But I'm not so sure about the China's intentions. Um, probably, you know, China's interest in buying more other currency bonds was obviously to uh, reduce their to reliance on the U.S., Particularly, you know, the American U.S. dollars has been becoming so devaluated that means, you know, the reducing its own values. But another explanation why China actually sold the two trillion yen value of the uh, bonds because Japanese yen was become stronger and stronger when China bought it. Of course, you know, the value was still a bit probably lower than now. So in this case, China believed now it's time for us to sell it to get the benefits. 
I think it's quite, this is a quite rational way of thinking. Rather than saying, you know, that China wanted to put the pressure on Japan <laughs> by manipulating, the, you know, the uh, uh, buying, selling the you know, national bond of Japan. So this is my impression, not answer. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I want to ask about uh, your opinion about actual possibility of TPP as a base of FDAAP. And for me, TPP seems like U.S. is moving on U.S.'s interest um, because the U.S. has terminated some negotiations with like Vietnam or some countries terminated negotiations on FTAs and they had to um, participate in negotiations of TPP to negotiate with the US and also in Japan um, after the US is US mentioned TPP its um, motivation to participate in TPP after that suddenly Japan also started to say about TPP because it have, has to have some kind of FDA with the US. That's why Japan started to engage into TPP. And also for me, TPP seems like a treaty to exclude China because it is a very high level um, treaty, China cannot um, participate soon. So is it, can, be, can it be seen like, see, seen like that from your perspective? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, certainly it is difficult for China to participate in TPP. It's too much probably uh, demanding. Um, but on the other hand, you know, the visa, you know, the uh, Vietnam, for example, and other developing countries is able to abide by the, some of the strict rules set by the United States. I don't think so. So in this case, Malaysia, how about? Malaysia, Vietnam, as you said, you know, just, you know, giving up the bilateral FTA talks with the United States, instead decided to join uh, TPP. And of course, I don't know about the you know, motivations behind that, but someone said you know, the Malaysia's case, well, um, well Prime Minister Rajiv, you know, the, uh, he's more like you know, the uh, different Prime Minister from uh, Dr. Mahathir, you know, more you know, the sympathetic or friendly to Western countries. And uh, suddenly, uh, I know it's about Vietnam, but they are still considered to be developing countries. That means they don't need to abide by the GATT articles you know, to meet the, uh, some of the conditions. Again, that participation, the decisions to participate in a negotiation TPP means, well, they would face quite difficult, you know, tough you know, the times. So in this case, we cannot easily say China is not likely to participate by looking at these two countries' cases. But uh, I have to say, USA, China, FTA, that would be very, very difficult. Or well, maybe I never considered about it <laughs> myself. Even China, Japan, FTA, officially never mentioned. So um, I agree with uh, probably, at least in you know, China, it's difficult. But uh, well, again, it's future oriented. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, second one, Japan's participation, TPP. But suddenly Japan was criticized by domestic actors, media. You know, we are always lagged behind the key regional countries who enthusiastically promote FTAs, like South Korea, for example. The coverage of the trade under the FTAs of Japan is less than 20%. Very small. So therefore, uh, new government you know, since last September have been pressured sort of to have more FTAs. But the point is, Japan has already 
signed FTA with ASEAN, individually with seven members. And India, Prime Minister, is coming this week uh, to sign probable FTA. And uh, South Korea's FTA is just frozen, and China never mentioned. So in this case, what I want to say, the, uh, whether Japan can have an FTA, it's quite limited bilaterally, for example. Only China and South Korea. And they are probably promoted within the trilateral frameworks. So what is else? Plus three FTA, plus six FTA, as I mentioned, already involved. Although the actual negotiation will need more time to start. So what is else? Maybe TPP. But as initial TPP, the number is much smaller, four or five. But <laughs> becoming more and more, which means more difficult for Japan to say yes. But uh, probably Canada is already saying yes, I heard. But if Korea decided to join, that might create some incentive within Japan to say yes to TPP. So Japan's probably FTA initiatives are more reactive rather than proactive in my views. So see what you know, the Korea will say in the future, very in the very near future. Then we can see Japan's different to say yes. But of course the question is whether Mr. Khan will be able to say something positively on TPP next month or not. This is probably more significant. Last question. Yes. Uh, First of all, uh, thank you for your presentation. But uh, I was wondering, you see, that uh, how would you characterize EPIC? You see, I understand ASEAN, I understand uh, East Asian regional cooperation, ASEAN plus three, ten, whatever you call it. But uh, because it's a diverse, uh, look at the diversity: U.S., Canada, and then Mexico, and then PNG and Russia. So where, and so this is a. Well, how would you such a diffuse system? So how would you, you know, cooperate as East uh, or you know characterize as East Asian regionalism or you know EPIC, you see, Asia Pacific? Uh. And second point, which I think you are trying to sensitize, is the if you bring in security issues, or you know uh, whether it's the hardcore security issues or you know kind of uh, strategic security issues, then. What's the point, you know, uh, of U.S. pursuing that type of policy? You see, what's the rationale behind U.S. bringing a non-economic, hardcore, or you know, soft security issues? Thank you. Okay. Well, let me state uh, the second question first. Well, hard security is probably not to the agenda for most of, except for ASEAN. But ASEAN has an ARF. And uh, not necessarily the uh, big issue, the agenda, it seems to me. Even APEC, I said, you know, the uh, uh, well, anti-terrorist measures. Well, I'm not so sure that this can be regarded as a hard security, hardcore security agenda, like territorial disputes, uh, well, defense agendas, etc. Because they are regarded as the uh, probable helping, for example, uh, poverty. Because you know, poverty considered to be a major cause for, the, for example, terrorists and etc. So I think the APEC, particularly using the uh, uh, security agenda, is initially to link up with the economic agendas, you know, rather than straightforwardly saying you know, we should deal with the, you know, um, stopping terrorism, etc. But you know, just taking advantage of the APEC, you know, characteristic, yes, characteristics which means economic cooperation, that is economic integration at that time, and uh, how we can stop the poverty and uh, helping more uh, non-threatening and uh, security agendas, including environment, etc. So I think the uh, U.S. interest in um, bringing hardcore security agenda is not necessarily uh, employed by the uh, institution which I mentioned here, but it was more on the ARF agenda. Well, more ad hoc institutions like six parties talks and uh, for the North Koreans. Epic characterizations. Oh, maybe you should ask the Epic <laughs> officers here, or ask the Epic secretariat uh, near the uh, NUS other campus. Um, to me, the uh, just to Epic. Characteristic is probably to 
bring Asia, bring America, maybe together to set up something differently from East Asia dealing with. But the EPIC had a long history. And uh, particularly the uh, summit meeting was quite significantly assessed uh, by ASEAN leaders because before setting up the ASEAN EU sum, US summit, there was no occasion for the US president coming down to Southeast Asia except for attending the APEC meetings. I think US president, you know, the um, visit to Southeast Asia are mainly done together with the, their own participation in the APEC meetings, particularly held in the Southeast Asian soils. For example, you know, the, uh, well, Brunei's meeting with, <laughs> Brunei's king's meeting with the US president, we hardly consider about it. But in Apex, it's a leader's meeting on equal footings. Brunei King could say something about you know, what he considered in relations with the United States. Obviously, US president is uh, present. He should listen to the, what you know, Brunei King says. So in this case, I think the leader's meeting was quite significant, particularly before the ASEAN-US summit were uh, organized since last year. But other than that, again, the well, Russia uh, PNG is well, quite diversified. So therefore, some people say that well, Russia is hosting APEC in two years' time, in 2012. And uh, many people actually said, you know, whether Russia is doing something uh, economically within the APEC framework. So I had some boys from Southeast Asian friend in Singapore, actually, that if U.S. and Japan this year, next year's host, cannot do anything APEC quite critically, APEC would die. So, thoroughly diversified membership is a characteristic, however, this creates some weakness, particularly regional cooperation needs the con uh, cohesiveness, but as, again, this membership simply lacks the cohesiveness. So, uh, this is the reason why APEC wide FDA is difficult, pipe dream. America needed to bring initially P4, now we call it TPP. Okay, uh, time has already uh, passed, so we, I just brought.